Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Vance. I'm a professor of education at Kansas State University. And I've been hanging out in the We the People program for 30 years. I suggest you don't do that. I, I want you to have a great experience today, but you shouldn't do this for 30 years like I've been. Well, maybe you should. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, we look forward to a great conversation. And I'll let my fellow judges introduce themselves to you. Hey everybody, Sean Arthurs, lawyer and former history teacher. I currently work as a global director of training. Looking forward to having a conversation with you today. Hello, my name is Luana Davis. I am working in Birmingham, Alabama for a law school. I am a professor there uh, and I direct the clinical programs, uh, but I'm also a professor of law. Great, and could you please introduce yourselves to us? Yeah, hello, my name is Andrew Betcher. Hi, my name is Kaylee Pender. Hello, my name is Allison Jimerson. Fantastic, we're uh, here to talk a little bit about question one in unit six which is Thomas Hobbes noted that life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. How has the human con condition changed over time? And how is it that that change reflected in our expectations of government? Should the principles of natural rights or classical republicanism guide policy changes designed to improve the condition of all people? What are the most pressing domestic and global challenges facing Americans today and in the future? What policies can you suggest to address them? We're ready when you are. After the February snowstorm, many states were left without power, most notably Texas. At its worst, 5 million Texans were without electricity, forcing them to boil snow for drinking water. The Texas state government faced harsh criticism for their inability to provide assistance. This disaster highlights the shift in expectations we have as citizens when it comes to our standard of living. As our society evolves, our expectations for government evolve with it. An example of this is the improvements in sanitation and health. In the 19th century, doctors did not wash their hands when switching from patient to patient, and sewer systems overflowed in cities. The horrible sanitation contributed to the spread of infectious diseases and the high child mortality rate. Fortunately, medical and sanitation, sanitation advancements have been made. These advancements not only prompted a change in practices, but also called for the government to provide more basic health services. Welfare is another example of the standard of living improving in the government's response to that change. In 1820, almost everyone lived in extreme poverty. However, as of 2016, less than 10% of Americans lived below the poverty line. The United States government helped facilitate this transition by creating federal programs such as food stamps, public housing, and social security. Essentially, as the standard of living improves, citizens believe they have an inherent right to the basic necessities and they expect the government to provide that. The Constitution allows the government to do so in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. Both natural rights philosophy and classical republicanism ensure that the common good will be put first. Hobbes and Locke theorize about a social contract in which individuals consent to be governed in exchange for protection of their individual rights. On the other hand, classical republicanism relies on individuals recognizing the needs of the community as more important than their own. Therefore, both principles should be used to improve the condition of people in order to protect the common good. Climate change is one of the most pressing challenges facing America today. There are numerous risks associated with this problem. Our food supply could be destroyed, causing famine. The U.S. could face water and resource competition with other nations, and climate-related terrorism and regional instability could create wars. The effects of climate change are also estimated to cost the U.S. economy $520 billion each year. All of these concerns and more pose major threats to our nation. To address this issue, classical republicanism can be used as a guide. Republicanism relies on the idea of the common good, where the well-being of the society as a whole is prioritized over the individual rights of citizens. Climate change can be solved by focusing on policies that benefit everyone, such as reinstating regulations that were rolled back in the previous administration, which will limit the effects of climate change. Congress must, be, must also allocate significant funding to climate initiatives, such as the Green Climate Fund, which works to protect all of our country's natural resources. 
The risks associated with climate change will heavily affect those in lower income families and more, especially, and more specifically those below the poverty line. Poverty, although declining, is still an issue in the United States with nearly 10% of the population living in poverty, including 12 million children. In order to solve this issue, we must look at natural rights philosophy for guidance. Locke wrote that we are all born with God-given rights that cannot be taken away, which include life, liberty, and property. These rights must be protected and provided for. In order to fight against poverty, government must provide for specific individuals by first increasing the minimum wage. Government should also improve existing programs such as food stamps, their earned income tax credit, and unemployment insurance, as well as create more programs focused on children, like the 2021 Child Tax Credit and the American Rescue Plan. These improvements could save many families from the repeating cycle of poverty. As citizens, we give our government the power and responsibility to look over us and ask our concerns. The government needs to address the concerns that the people are bringing forward, starting with climate change and poverty. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, some great examples. We're gonna we're gonna dig right in. Uh, so, President Biden has decided that there's going. This is hypothetical, of course. Has decided that there's going to be a new national mask mandate. Right. So we're trying to balance the spread of COVID and he's recognizing all the different. But he has decided, you know, we need to quash this thing right away. National mask mandate. Anytime you leave your house, you must wear a mask or you will be fined. Thinking about the natural rights and classical republicanism and some of also your practical lenses, do you support this kind of legislation or do you think it's just uh, not necessary um, and goes too far? What would be your take? Um, I can start on that. So I think that definitely um, exemplifies classical republicanism. And I think I would agree with this national mandate only because we have lost so many lives to COVID. And I just feel like it would be, we would need to be putting the um, rights of the whole country and the benefits of the whole country before individuals who won't be willing to wear the mask. Yeah, and adding on to that, I think we can also look through at this through a, a natural rights philosophy lens and talk about life, liberty, and property. And, and one of those is life. And um, it, for someone else to not wear a mask and possibly um, spread COVID to you, which is a deadly disease, um, that's taking away your right to life. So I think it's important that we, we balance the looking at both classical Republicanism and natural rights and see that both apply in a national mask mandate um, and providing for the common good and for the individual rights. I'm gonna have to disagree with my teammates. I feel like there is a line that should be set when it comes to government controlling what we do with our personal lives. Yes, I do believe that we do need to wear a mask, but I feel like that does come down to the person and their rights as an individual to choose to wear that mask if they please. Um, I feel like the First Amendment gives us that right to be able to provide what we want for our lives. Um, and our, the right to life is essentially ours and we control that. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague for the next question. Ms. Davis, you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? The, what are, I want to make sure I'm, um, we're still on unit one, right? Yes. <laughs> unit six. Okay, I mean, sorry, sorry, unit one. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, question, we, question one. Question one, yes. Yeah. We still on question one, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Just want to make sure. <laughs> okay. Um, we, you've um, suggested that classical republicanism and policies that benefit everyone um, are the way that we ought to go. I'm curious about how you see that intersecting with democracy and people who don't agree with some of the things that, uh, some of the decisions that you've made about policies that benefit everyone. Uh, in other words, who gets to decide who the policies are that it benefit everyone and how does that intersect with de democracy and what the people want? Um, well, I think that just goes back to what the United States democracy is kind of built on. Um, we're supposed to be a representative government for everybody. So if we do have representatives in government who are accurately representing what those people want, then it's most likely that um, the common good will be put first anyway, unless 
it's kind of this unique situation where a group of people have this representative that is just totally different from the other people who are in government. Do you think that most Americans today agree that we ought to do something about climate change collectively? Um, I think if we look at, I think the most recent public opinion polls show that there's around 10% of Americans that still um, think no, that climate change is not the issue to focus on today. Um, but I think that a majority of Americans, even um, on both sides of the aisle really, um, agree that at least something needs to be done about climate change. And I think the debate is much more today focused on what exactly that is and who exactly the responsibility falls upon, whether it's the individual companies, um, maybe taxes, regulations, um, and what role the government plays in um, stifling climate change and maybe even reversing it. So. What happens when the majority makes a mistake? The you know, a, 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 a government makes a mistake. Well, then what? Then what do we do? Well, as citizens, we vote our representatives in. And if we don't like something that they do, we're obviously not going to vote for them again in their second term. So I feel like the people have a responsibility to recognize the mistakes that their representatives are making and recognize that they did maybe vote the wrong person in and then fix their changes as we go. Perfectly legitimate um, uh, answer. Any other ways that uh, we can, you know, democracies make mistakes, right? I mean, that. I have examples uh, at the ready. Uh, so what do we, we can vote them out of office. Anything else we can do? I mean, we obviously, throughout time, we've repealed many, many laws. And I think um, there's been many examples of laws, um, especially during the war on drugs that um, we are seeing today being heavily um, reversed, um, especially about the criminality of drug offenses. And I think that we learned from our mistakes of that time and that the criminalization of um, drugs is not really the path to go. C completely reasonable response. Anything else we can do? Um, yes, I was gonna, if it gets to the extreme of we just don't like the government at all. It is our right in the Constitution um, to overthrow the government, essentially, and, play, and put a new one into place. That, that's certainly a part of natural rights thinking. Thank you very much. Go back to Mr. Arthurs. Yeah, so team, I'm confused. We talk about the human condition changing over time. And all of a sudden, I'm learning that racism is now a public health crisis, that the CDC and other groups are saying that racism is a public health. So has, have humans changed? Has our view of government changed? Has it, why has racism now become something that we're calling a public health crisis? Why is this, is this a challenge? What's going, do you agree or disagree with the designation? Or, and if you agree, why? Um, I, I think it has always been a public health problem. Um, you can look at, for example, black women are at a much higher rate to die during um, labor than their white counterparts. So that's clearly a medical and health problem. And I think that has always been there, just maybe um, more companies are coming out and actually acknowledging it. Racism has always been instituted since the beginning of America, since slavery. We see that through redlining that happened right after the Civil War. Black Americans were put into lower income areas, lower um, educated areas, and that's still happening today. And we see that with sanitation. We talk about Flint, Michigan and the water crisis, how that area is predominantly Black Americans and how nothing's being changed to help that. Um, whereas in other white communities, it's more higher income areas and less poverty. And we need to recognize that. And I feel like the way it's being more um, about time. You can finish your, yeah. are you finished? Say, it's always been there, but we are now realizing it through social media and the spread of social media. Fantastic work, uh, Unit 6. Thank you so much for that conversation. I have a list of other things that I wanted to explore uh, with you that we won't get to. Uh, perhaps I'll start with the, the feedback. Uh, I really liked your opening statement was, you know, that answered the question, it was clear. You addressed uh, every aspect I felt of the questions and, and that's what you were supposed to do. But the rubber really meets the road uh, in the follow-up questions where, where you were also impressive and were able to provide you know, some, some fairly clear and specific uh, responses. In my question in particular, um, 
it, you know, you missed one biggie. Uh, and the one biggie philosophically is we have, we, we respect both the common good and individual rights. So we have this thing called the constitution and it sits above uh, governments, uh, all of our governments, uh, federal government, state governments, local governments. And when things get really bad, when demo democracies make mistakes all the time, and, uh, and sometimes they make really egregious mistakes, right? Slavery, denying women the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can appeal to something larger than our government officials. What you all, all of your examples were right on. We, we do that, we can vote them out of office, but we can also make a rights claim. When democracy makes a mistake, we, and it's a, an egregious mistake, we can make a claim based upon higher law of the constitution. So, but that's a small point. Uh, and I thought that you, you really did a nice job. Uh, colleagues, other kinds of feedback. Give some some very quick and pointed feedback came. I liked how you wrought, for example, with the mask question, you raised both classical and the natural rights. And then there was some disagreement within the team. I like that. And I also like, you know, we hit a we hit a the third rail in America, started talking about race there at the end. And you jumped right in. You had specific examples. And I also I like Kaylee how you talked about how racism has always been here. And then sort of we talked about how now we're just naming it. So uh, you should be confident in your abilities going forward. You took that issue on. Um, it was responsive. And I liked uh, how you presented both sides, two takes on some of like the math question, for example. Thanks, y'all. Ms. Davis, do you have some feedback? You know, I thought that uh, one of your strengths was your reasoning. And yes, of course, I agree with my fellow justices. You want to put the constitutional right to redress from the government. You definitely want to throw that into part of what you're presenting, right? Because that's one of the few citizen rights that we have along with voting and serving on juries is the right to redress. Uh, and so, but uh, I thought uh, your reasoning was good. Uh, and I do enjoy, I did enjoy the illustrations that you put forward. I think that uh, do remember that there are times when the government does have to kind of override individual rights in order to ensure the safety of the whole. If we looked back at the tuberculosis health situation from many, many years ago, uh, we would be a different country if we had not instituted some of the restrictions on individual rights. So it's not always a free for all. <laughs> Yeah, it's an excellent point. Uh, uh, none of our rights are really unlimited. You know, there we're, we're, we can always put um, restrictions on them when uh, when it's really necessary to do so. That's a great point. And I take it that that's the core of the Leviathan, which is I, I, at least that's what I take from. You're exactly. I, I think so. Yeah, exactly that right. To adhere to some system of government. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, good job and congratulations.